Law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made by Boston City TV, a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications, and is being broadcast on Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Fios Channel 962. Some more housekeeping information to keep in mind during this meeting. Closed captioning is available. You can access it by clicking the CC button at the bottom of the screen. If you have trouble accessing it, chat disability staff for assistance. ASL interpretation is also available. If you would like to have the ability to multi-pin the interpreters, please chat the disability staff for assistance. Remember to refrain from interrupting the interpreters and allow time to them to finish translating before speaking. Per the agenda, public input is near the end of the meeting. If you have a question or comment before that, please use the chat. If there is time, we may be able to answer before the public input period. Please mute, you, mute yourself when you are not speaking to minimize background noise, and please identify yourself before speaking. This increases accessibility. Finally, use the Zoom raise hand function if you want to speak and wait to be recognized to begin. This gives disability staff time to pin you, which increases communication access. And with that, I will turn it over to our chair, Wesley Ireland. Wes, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, this is Wes. I'm just uh, wanted to begin here. Let me just get my notes. So the meeting is now called to order. We're going to start off with introductions, please, of the members. And I'd like to ask each member of the commission to mention their name and their role and which area of the city they live in. I'll begin with myself. My name is Wes, and I'm using American Sign Language throughout this meeting. And for people who are listening, I'm actually a man, but I'm using two female interpreters, two female sign language interpreters, so you can hear their voices while I'm signing. I'm the chair of the commission, and I live in the North End. And I'm looking next for, um, on my Zoom screen, and I see Olivia. So Olivia, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Olivia Richard. I am a member of the board, and I am from Brighton. Thank you, Olivia. Richard, would you go next, please? Hi, I'm Richard Glowski, a member of the commission, and I live in Back Bay. Great. Charlie? Would you go next? Hello, my name is Charlie Kim. I am a North End resident and I am on the board at representing parents and caregivers with um, children with disabilities. Thank you, Charlie. Ducia, please. You're next. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Dusia Lvovskaya, Dusia for short, and I'm the vice chair, and I am in Boston, specifically Mission Hill. Thank you. Okay. Paulette. <clears throat> My name is Paulette Durrett. I'm a member of the commission, and I live in Mattapan. Thank you. Jerry. 
Why don't you go ahead next? Hi. Yes, my name is Jerry Boyd, and I live in West Roxbury, and I'm a proud member of the advisory board. Okay. And Commissioner McCosh. Hi, everybody. I'm Krista McCosh. I'm the Disability Commissioner and ADA Title II co Coordinator for the City of Boston. I live in South Boston. And I also see um, a few more board members maybe who didn't get introduced. Uh, Elizabeth, did you go yet? No, I didn't. Hello. Yeah, sorry, I'm going in terms of who I see on my screen. But yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, that's fine. Um, I'm Elizabeth Jean Power. I'm on the advisory board as a member, and I live in Back Bay. Okay. Juan Carlos, would you go next? Yes, hi. This is Juan Carlos Ramirez, uh, advisory board member, and I live in Boston South End. Thank you. And I believe that is everyone who is here. Let's see. Okay, next we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, we do have a quorum. So I'd like to, would somebody like to make a motion to um, open the discussion? This is Jerry uh, West. I move to approve the minutes. Okay. And who would like to second that? Charlie? Charlie second. Okay, all in favor, please raise your hand or say aye. So I can say aye. aye. Okay, are there any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so uh, it appears that the meeting minutes have been approved. Thank you, everyone. I know that we're supposed to have a presenter this evening from Fenway Park, <clears throat> but we're gonna hold that for just a little bit longer because they're expected to join us at six. <clears throat> so I'm gonna <clears throat> go ahead and move uh, with my chair's report. So after, after I give my chair's report, uh, we should hopefully have our guest speakers with us. So I'm going to start out with the Disability Community Forum that occurred last week, and it was a success. It was great to see many of you, many from the Commission members at the event. Mayor Wu uh, came to the event and gave a short speech on how she's committed to accessibility for the City of Boston. And there were some big topics that the community raised. These are issues or concerns that were related to the MBTA, infrastructure, and housing. We do still encourage people to report, any Boston residents, to please report any specific issues relating to accessibility by using the 311 app or calling 311 to report any issues, and in most cases, they will be resolved in a timely manner. One of the participants of the Disability Community Forum introduced himself, and this is Mr. Jake Handel, and he is the founder of 
the Ahoy app that was, um, it's a platform that was launched earlier this year. In fact, there was an article about him and his startup company, Ahoy, in the Boston Globe. It was about a few weeks ago. And so what does Ahoy do? Well, the app collects ratings and photos from users who file accessibility reports at the level of detail that's needed to guide people with a variety of um, scores. People who have with a variety of people with disabilities, various disabilities, and also lets users input their needs um, and returns these personalized scores for the accessibility of different uh, venues. It also lets users, um, right now it's actually focusing on Boston for the time being, and it's surprising that the Google Maps or Yelp doesn't have any accessibility features at restaurants uh, and other venues. So tomorrow is the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Constituents Day at the Mass Masters Estate House. And the event is going from 10 to 12 noon. So this is an in-person event that's gonna be held, it's hosted by um, the MCDHH, the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, Statewide Advisory Council. And that's an annual event that's back after a three year pause. There will be some changes this year because they've confirmed that there are, there's interpreting services and, can, and CART uh, services, um, but there won't be a rally and there will be no exhibit tables. Um, there'll be no networking lunch and that there will be a brief speaking program to recognize the former award winners from the past three years. And so this is an opportunity to meet with the state legislators and educate them um, with the deaf and hard of hearing community needs. Now we know that the presenter um, is going to be talking about Fenway Park shortly and I just want to let you know that there will be a deaf and hard of hearing night coming up at Fenway Park that's scheduled for June 3rd and the tickets are still available um, and there is a a link a moment while I grab that. I'm gonna post the link in the chat for people. So a percentage of the ticket sales is going to be given to, they'll go to two local nonprofit organizations. That's Deaf Incorporated and our Deaf Survivors Center. And so lastly, Speaking, can I hear? I'm sorry to interrupt. We, we have no audio right now, Lori. We cannot hear you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Lori, we cannot hear you. Yeah, we've been told just to pause for one moment. It's technical difficulties on our end.
Recording in progress. Okay, I think we have sound again, so we can continue. Okay, great. Would you like me to continue? I'll continue with my report. Yes. So again, again, the acronym ESCAPE, E-S-C-A-P-E. Again, talks about E for exercise, S for sleep, C for connect, A for appreciate, P for play, and E for exhale. And so these are six simple things that we can do that will improve mental health. And I guess now with the warmer weather upon us, we are all going to be able to do many of these things. Um, so that's the end of my chair's report. Are there any questions? about the report. Okay, so while we're waiting for our um, representat representatives from Fenway, I, um, I'm gonna have um, I'm wondering if Patricia, Patricia could give yeah, the architectural report. Yeah, we'll have Patricia go ahead. Thanks. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Mendez, and I'm going to give the architectural access report. Um, my title is Director of Architectural Access, and I'm happy to be here and bring up a question that Elizabeth brought up on last meeting. So Elizabeth, thank you for that. Um, and the subject today is about the Architectural Access Board bills and their status. Um, I put a, the first slide here just to explain what the Architectural Access Board is. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the State Architectural Access Board. Um, is a regulatory board that does multiple things. So I, I'm not going to read the whole slide, but I put the bullet points uh, to explain what the Architectural Access Board is and how their work uh, intersects with our work here in this city. I'm one of the members of the Architectural Access Board, so every other Monday I, I serve in, in the board. Um, but the question is about the the bills updates. So the good news is that the two bills, one from the House and one from the Senate, they both have been reintroduced this year uh, with the exact same language as last year. Um, the purpose of the bill is to uh, ensure more accessible housing units and workplaces that are available in the state by bringing such buildings under the purview of the Market Massachusetts Architectural Access Board when newly built or when major renovations take place. Um, this information uh, comes from DPC and the contact for DPC is Charlie Carr and there's the email address and the phone number. It's Charles Carr at dpcma.org and the phone number is 978-361-6682. Um, the potential advisory board actions regarding the bills are in the four bullet points. One is to make a motion to update the support letter for H2291S1553 from last year with the same language. Make a motion to prepare individual testimony for a future hearing on the bills. 
Um, the date and the time of the hearing is to be determined. Make a motion to monitor the bills and add to future agenda of this um, board when hearing dates become available. And lastly, make a motion to contact the Disability Policy Consortium to ask them to present about the bills in a future meeting. Um, next, please. The other topic that I would like to talk about is um, separate but related. It's also the state Massachusetts Architectural Access Board regulation. Um, the, the background of what I'm going to talk about is um, that the MAAB regulations are part of the state building code. So 780 CMR is the state building code. And the building code adopted the international building code, which is called IBC, with Massachusetts amendments. Now, within that code, there, chapter 11, which talks about accessibility, is completely replaced by the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board regulations that we also called 521 CMR. Okay, so once upon a time, there was a committee that worked in updating these regulations. That happened between 1996, which was the last time that these regulations were updated. And then there was a, uh, like 10 years of work, and then there was a pause. And then in 2022, this subcommittee reconvened to start all, to continue this work of the rewrite of these regulations. Um, so I'm happy to be serving in this subcommittee, and I'm happy to be also serving in the Architectural Access Board. So we have been meeting every month to continue the work. The goal of this rewrite is to make the regulations um, better, more updated, with better graphic, and also to align with the federal regulations, which are the ADA 2010 guidelines. The meetings are public. We meet every month, and the meetings are virtual. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. But actually, I want to go back to the slide where we have the potential actions for the board, because I think that is um, the information that I want to have in front of us. But I'm open for questions. I see Charlie's hand. Go ahead, Charlie. Hi, um, this is Charlie Kim. Patricia, thank you for the presentation. I'm just kind of asking for some clarity um, on these housing bills and then uh, the architectural access um, within the Disabilities Commission. Uh, last week uh, during the meeting, there were questions uh, about housing and housing equity, but uh, the commissioner had referred and stated that all those questions get referred to the um, housing equity office. Um, I believe that that's the right department. So I was just wondering how, where is that, that, that line and delineation when it is for housing equity versus, um, and I have to read the regulations, I apologize for H.2291. Um, I just want to make sure I understand as we look to update the support letter, but then also as we send a message to people and constituents that are asking um, about housing equity that we then refer them to the Office of Housing Equity. Sure. I think it makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Great question. So the Housing Stability Office is what we were talking about uh, last week in the forum. The Housing Stability Office is a city of Boston um, office. What I'm talking about today is the state regulations. So it's a separate subject. 
Did I answer the question? Hi, it's Kristen. Can I add a little more context to that question? Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Patricia. So, Charlie, the way to think of it is um, housing has so many different complexities to it. There's building accessible housing. There's trying to help people uh, pay for accessible housing. There's uh, placing people in accessible housing. So the city has uh, works on that in multiple facets. The Office of Housing Stability that Patricia mentioned, mentioned and that we talked about at the forum, they actually do case management. They help place people in housing. Our office doesn't do that. And then we have an Office of Fair Housing and Equity. They process complaints of discrimination um, of any protected class in housing. So if you are a woman, if you were discriminated against um, on gender or um, race or disability, the Office of Fair Housing and Equity will investigate those claims. What Patricia does is with the AAB, they work strictly on building code. And that's kind of how we, dif we um, differentiate the AAB from the ADA. The ADA is a civil rights law. So that means, you know, not only does the house have to be accessible, but or building have to be accessible, but the policies regarding the building have to be accessible. AAB is strictly building code. Are the doorways wide enough? Does the elevator fit to scale? Strictly building code, no civil rights at all. But this particular building code has to do with accessibility, and that's the one that Patricia's focusing on. So any changes we make for accessibility in the building code will translate into more accessible housing being built, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you very much. This is Wes. I noticed that Elizabeth Dean Clower had their hand raised. Do you have a question, Elizabeth? Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, for, um, Patricia. I also thought um, that, that what this referred to was, um, say, in commercial buildings, the um, space where employees might be working. And so therefore, one of the problems is that, say, if a um, building is undergoing a major renovation, and therefore, um, you know, by the significance of the renovation in dollars, square footage, et cetera, that, that what would be exempt is certain, it would not require that all employee space be accessible. And therefore, um, cert, um, people, certain potential employees with certain disabilities, disability, say a mobility disability, might not be able to um, participate in the work in that area. Some businesses have gotten around that by saying, you know, they could use a conference room, you know, elsewhere in a part of the building that's accessible. But the problem with that is so much goes on um, with employees um, in accomplishing the work informally as well as informal space. So is that a correct interpretation, Patricia and Commissioner? Yes. Um, yeah, so the bill that we're talking about does include the employee spaces. And um, the, way, the way I worded it is kind of um, confusing, but yeah. The employee spaces being under the preview of the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board regulations, that means that it will be improved and the workspaces will be included in the code. Because in that sense, it's been, for lack of a, a different word to think of, a major loophole that, in, in a sense, people with, um, with some disabilities can be discriminated against, so to speak and that they cannot occupy spaces that their other employees um, would be, you know, would be required to have reasonable accommodations or accessibility. And my other um, on related note, um, my other understanding is that part of what year in and year out has been a problem is that there's a strong, um, excuse me, I just have a catch in my throat. Um, 
there's a strong um, oppositional force by certain realtors in the city. And is, is that also where the problems seem to be? Because in, in thinking about the different options or drafting a letter, in addition, other than just updating the letter to reflect this year's date, I don't know, not that we can take on the politics of what's going on, but I'm just wondering if taking, um, and now with uh, additional board members or a, a second look um, on all of our parts, is there, is there anything different we can think of or is there anything about this year that might make, make it more um, possible to achieve this goal? Um, I know that this bill has been um, in front of committee for many years. Um, I want to say 20 years. So I feel like we're getting closer and closer. And last year we had a lot of um, really powerful testimony. I thought there was a good chance that it would pass. I don't know of anything that would be different this year. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, that we continue to inch closer, and I encourage all of you to come and testify when the com time comes and to um, prepare ahead of time and get in contact with DPC and get the information out and continue to work towards. Anything else, Commissioner? And this is Wes. I do actually have a follow-up question for you, Patricia about your asks for the board to make several different motions and regarding the letter. Um, I believe that the board had done something like this letter in the past, right? But when was the last time that we submitted a letter in regards to these bills? I think it was um, February of last year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, shall we make a motion then? Or shall we wait? Charlie? Go ahead. But would it be possible to see the, the letters that uh, maybe they were emailed and I missed them, I apologize, but would it be possible to see uh, before we make a motion or to, to redistribute those, those letters of support and everything so we can review them? This is Wes, yes. Uh, that's very fair, Charlie. Um, perhaps we can discuss this in the next meeting. So, um, question. I, um, sure. Commissioner and Patricia, is, is there a uh, time, time around uh, the letters? Is this something that, that you need for possibly the session? Or um, I, I don't want to delay something by just asking um, if, if I can review it. I don't want to slow anything down if this is time sensitive. Um, no, this wouldn't be slowing us down because we don't have um, a date for the hearing yet. So this is per for perfect time to to get the information and discuss it and prepare for it. And commissioner is putting in the in the chat that next month is it's fine. Okay. And Elizabeth, go ahead. Um, yes, I had a quick question. It's more um, point of order that um, would, when we're requesting uh, to have, say, in this case, Disability Policy Consortium um, come and speak to us, do we usually do that as a motion versus a request, or does that strengthen? Uh, I I think there are sometimes we've agreed to I I'm just 
not clear about if that strengthens it to do it as a motion and take a vote, that's fine. I just was uh, requesting clarity. This is Wes. I don't think it requires a motion. I believe it's just a request. Okay. Well, we can figure out something perhaps. Um, I know we have a lineup of what's happening next month and uh, through the summer. So it may be a situation that we need to wait off for them into the fall, but I believe it would be good timing to have it sooner rather than later. Okay. Any further questions for Patricia? So we can discuss this further at next month's meeting. And we definitely can discuss that under old business for the next month's meeting. At this time, let's move forward with the next item on the agenda, which is the presentation by Sarah Coffin, who is a representative of Fenway Park. So go ahead, Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I am also joined tonight by Brenna Peterson, uh, who is my co-captain of our new uh, employee resource groups. Um, so we had wanted to come, and we really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to us present. Um, we wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the programmatic um, issues that we've been working on at Fenway, and obviously get some feedback and open uh, open some lines of communication uh, between everybody. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK, to show my presentation. Sarah, oh. is there any way um, you, your audio is very, very low? Is there anything you can do about that? No. Sorry about that. Just wanted to check since your audio was very low. Um, let me see if I can get it. It's a little better. Okay. Um, so I apologize. I left my, my other headset at home today. Um, so I'm using my backup set. Is that, is that any better? It is. Um, fantastic. Uh, so I would love to share our presentation. I don't know if someone has it preloaded, um, but I can't. I don't. I can't share my screen. Sarah, I can share your slides if that would help. Yeah, it just yeah. it says the host is disabled. Oh well, then then yeah, let me do that right now. <laughs> and there you go. Fabulous. Um, so thank you all again uh, for having us. Um, my name is Sarah Coffin, and I am the Alumni Relations Manager and Team Curator at Fenway, uh, which means I work with retired players and uh, historic artifacts. Uh, I am joined um, by Brenda Peterson, who is our accounting operations specialist um, and was also our longtime uh, receptionist. Um, the third person uh, on the photo on your screen is Elaine Stewart, uh, who has been our longtime senior VP and assistant general counsel. Um, she is our, the way we have it set up, she is our champion. Um, so we are co-captains of an employee resource group and Elaine is our kind of head person. Um, Elaine uh, couldn't join us tonight, um, but she's been doing this work for a number of years. She's been with the Red Sox uh, since the 1980s. Um, and for all of us, this is very much a passion project um, versus kind of full-time, you know, a full-time accessibility coordinator or job in that sense. Um, so all of us are are doing are doing this most, you know, to increase access at Fenway um, for both our employees and fans. 
Um, for us, this is a kind of a 60-40 approach. Um, so about 60% of our energy goes into making uh, Fenway Park more accessible for our employees and our staff um, through education initiatives, um, through working with particular employees, um, obviously being a resource for folks. Um, Sarah, could, this is the interpreter. Can you hold just one moment? Um, I'm having a, you're speaking very quickly and my, the audio is, is not working all of a sudden for me. One second to the interpreter. Sorry, it's technical difficulties tonight. Don't be stuck. That's better. <laughs> That's better. Let me see if I can. I can hear you now. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that. I'll also slow down. I apologize. I, uh, I'm from a big family. I'm used to talking fast because that's the only way you get a word in. <laughs> um, so we have a 60-40 a approach here where uh, we try to have about 60% of our energy and time devoted to our, to our employees, um, to integrating um, and to attracting employees, um, and having people feel comfortable in their roles here, whether they're a ticket taker or a front office employee. Um, and then about 40% of our energy goes into a fan-facing or front-facing approach. Um, so whether that be theme nights we have here at Fenway, one-on-one um, -on -one employee support, social interactions, um, we are basically, you know, mainly a programmatic piece um, to support uh, all of the employees that we have here at the ballpark. Um, so Brett and I are going to uh, switch off doing slides. Um, so we can go to the next slide, and then uh, mm -hmm. Brenna is going to take it from here. Hey, everyone. I'm Brenna Peterson. I'm excited to be here tonight. So this is an overview of our employee resource groups we have at Fenway. We just started them a year ago, um, currently celebrating the one-year celebration anniversary this week. Um, so we have six employer resource groups, 250 active members throughout the front office. Um, tonight we're going to be highlighting the SPAND network, which is the sensory, ambulatory, and neurodiversity network. Um, we have 15 cultural and identity nets planned for this season, different celebrations. Um, tonight we're going to be speaking about the Disability Pride celebration we have coming up. Um, that's what we'll be highlighting. Um, and the idea of the employee resource groups and the DEI initiatives is part of our ongoing effort to make the ballpark feel um, welcoming and inclusive for all fans. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So I'm going to be talking about this as well. Um, Disability Pride Night 2023 is going to be July 26th, 7 p.m. versus the Atlanta Braves. Um, this year, for the first time, we decided on a theme, which is sport and inclusion, and we're going to be highlighting different partnerships. Um, we're excited to be welcoming Adaptive Sports New England, which is a Massachusetts nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing participation amongst New England youth and who have visual and mobility impairments, um, as well as Beat Baseball, also known as the Boston Renegades. Beat Baseball is a form of baseball uh, that can be played by people who are visually impaired using a ball that beeps. Um, we'll also be welcoming the Special Olympics and also the Challenger League, which is the Little League's um, adaptive baseball program. Um, we're going to be featuring a giveaway, which is this hat. Um, we're excited to say that it has um, our uh, Disability Pride logo on it, as well as um, Red Sox in Braille in front. So we are very excited to feature that giveaway. Um, do you have anything else to add, Sarah? Um. No, I think the only thing I would add, um, so we had done a disability awareness night at the ballpark um, for several years. And one of the big initiatives that we've taken on in the last year is to kind of switch our branding, thinking, and the way we approach um, 
way that we approach this same night um, to disability pride versus disability awareness, right? So getting people mm -hmm. and fans to, you know, awareness is, uh, awareness is not the goal as much as uh, celebration is the goal of these communities, of these resources. Um, and making people feel like Fenway is, is a home, is a home for all. Uh, we can move to the next slide. I think Brenna's done with this one. Um, we do have two other smaller initiatives this year. Um, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Night at Fenway, uh, which will be June 3rd, uh, which is the second of two games on June 3rd. We work with uh, Deaf Inc and the Deaf Survivors Fund uh, for this particular event. I think this is the fourth year uh, we had a Deaf and Hard of Hearing Night at Fenway, um, and it's been you know, quite successful over the years. Actually, if I if I if I could add, um, it hasn't been that many. It's actually been more like I think this is the fourth year. It's been a number of years. So, yeah, three or four. It was something around that. Something around that. Thing. So thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. Um, that was Wes. Yeah. Oh, Wes, I apologize, Wes. Um, so, so yeah. So it's been it's been successful for a number of years. Um, we decided to add a blind low vision in version of um, of a theme night, uh, which is focusing on obviously visual impairment and the, the blind community um, from the listening and learning um, that I've done, you know, in this role, one of the things that came up very early on is that baseball is a very descriptive sport and therefore um, there are a number of folks who are big baseball fans uh, within, within the blind low vision community. Um, and so we obviously wanted to extend, um, just extend a version of, uh, of deaf and hard of hearing and blind low vision into their own, uh, into their own pieces. Um, and so that will be on, on June 4th um, of this year. We can move to the next slide. So one of the things we debuted this year uh, was a brand new assisted listening device system. Um, for those who have been to Fenway in the past, um, we used to have assisted listening devices that used radio wave frequency. Um, so you had a non-delayed radio um, while you were in the ballpark. Uh, one of the things you would need to do is go to one of our fan services booths, pick up one of these radios, leave a deposit, um, and then return the radio at the end at the end of the evening. Um, there were a lot of different issues with this particular system. One was um, when we were playing a game that was not our home radio or WEEI, um, so like ESPN or another national broadcast, um, sometimes the feed would get blocked or, or kind of cut out. Uh, we were also finding that there was areas of the ballpark that had better reception than others. Um, so this year we moved to a, a Wi-Fi internet enabled system um, through the Listen Everywhere app. Um, so <coughs> this allows people to use their own device um, versus having to uh, get a separate device uh, when they're at the ballpark. Uh, we also have a number of devices preloaded with the Listening Everywhere app for anyone who may not have their own device or doesn't want to use their own device um, that evening. Um, so this has been a, a new process um, that we have uh, put, into the, put into the ballpark this year that we certainly wanted to um, let you folks know about. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So all verbal pre-game, in-game, and post-game PA is live captioned to our MLB Ballpark app. Um, we have um, captioning uh, on the lower left and lower right field LED displays during pre-game ceremonies. Um, we display lyrics to the national anthem, take me out to the ball game, as well as Sweet Caroline on the New Balance video board in right field. Um, so we are very proud to offer closed captioning throughout the duration of the Red Sox home games. And the app has brought us 
um, you know, the great information that we can use. So happy to share with that. Um, we can advance to the last slide. So certainly we just touched on a few different pieces. Um, there are multiple, uh, you know, multiple parts of access, multiple pieces of access, things that um, obviously accessibility is never done. Um, there's always things that we can kind of improve on, um, but we certainly wanted to uh, introduce ourselves to this group, um, talk to you guys about some of the initiatives we're working on, and basically start a dialogue. Right, um, so you know, open up the lines of communication um, for folks to know that we're here, we're a resource, and um, you know, we want to keep improving. Um, obviously, Fenway Park is a historic structure. As someone who um, works in, works with team history, uh, I'm very well aware that we're 111 years old. Um, so there are lots of issues that go along with that as well. Um, but we're hoping that. In, in more programmatic action, um, we can continue to bridge um, some of the access gaps that we've had in the past. So um, we are, we're here to listen, um, and we're happy to open it up to questions. OK, this is Wes again. Um, I did want to let you know that um, we are going to open the floor for questions. First, the board can ask a few questions if they have any. And then once any members of the board have asked their questions, then we can, the public and general public can ask a question. So I see a few hands already. So I'm going to go ahead and let Richard and then Jerry and then Elizabeth uh, have a question. And then I might have a question afterwards, but we'll go ahead uh, first with Richard. Thanks, Wes. Um, I'm curious, um, what happens on deaf and hard of hearing night and blind low vision day? Um, you know, what are the activities? Um, you know, are there adjustments made in the ballpark for that day particularly? Exactly how do those days work? So, a um, couple of things. Uh, so, one of the – we have um, – a, our mobility assistance team who are always here for every game. Um, but on Blind Low Vision Night specifically, uh, we have partnered with uh, the Carroll Center and Perkins School uh, to have additional sighted guides available um, for folks uh, who may be navigating the ballpark um, without a guide. Um, we also, the biggest part of these games is twofold. The, social interaction uh, between folks gathering, um, folks who are all um, passionate about um, their communities, and then also honoring particular groups uh, in a pregame ceremony on the field. So creating um, some action and awareness um, specifically with these groups. Um, deaf and hard of hearing and blind low vision specifically have a donation component where part of the ticket price goes back to these nonprofits um, to help benefit the work that they do. Okay, thank you. Jerry, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you very much, Wes. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, my question, I guess, goes on, piggybacks onto Richard's question. Um, so you mentioned uh, particularly that the uh, deaf and hard of hearing uh, uh, day, day or evening has been a success. Um, I was going to ask, how do you measure that success? You measure that success by the amount of, of folks taking advantage of that night? I mean, you know, what, what, what are some, some measurements of success for you? Um, I think one of the biggest measurements of success is um, obviously getting, starting to get community interaction 
between the organization and the Red Sox, um, which is something that uh, we've worked with Decade and the Death Survivors Fund for, um, as Wes said, three or four years now. Um, so the fact that these organizations have a continual relationship is the first kind of pillar of success in our mind. Um, obviously, you could say, oh, ticket sales, that's a level, you know, that's a level of success, or, um, you know, kind of participation to be a level of success, um, which again, those are numbers that could definitely, you know, be a part of things, um, but success to us is the relationships and the celebrations. Um, so celebrating the community, getting individuals out to the ballpark who may have felt excluded in the past, um, and getting people to, you know, have conversations um, are, are big levels of success for us, more so than what, uh, you know, the amount of ticket sales specifically. Um, we also, you know, we also want to make sure that we aren't, um, events aren't so big that we're losing, um, you know, the ability to help individuals um, and, and create accommodations. Um, on the scale so that everybody who's coming to the game, um, you know, has the accommodations that they need. Um, can I just ask a uh, follow-up to that for uh, specifically like for the uh, for the blind and, and low vision uh, night, do you set aside, uh, is there a particular uh, areas of the ballpark uh, that you set aside the tickets in uh, I haven't yet, uh, not being blind or low vision I haven't um, you know needed those those services so so I'm just, I just want to familiarize myself so if I encourage you know uh, you know folks who, who may be able to take advantage to to go that night I want to be able to give them uh, you know guidance as to what to expect um, so Deaf and hard of hearing and blind low vision are specifically community theme nights. Um, so we work with particular groups. Um, so and so like for blind and low vision, Perkins and Carroll are community partners, um, as well as working with the National Braille Press. Um, so specifically, we're targeting folks in those communities um, to all sit together, to all be in a part of the ballpark together, so that there is a social element as well as the donation element. Um, for Disability Pride, that is a much more open event. Um, so there are all levels of the ballpark, all different seating options available. Um, so those aren't specifically you know, kind of catered that way. Um, sure. But um, yeah, for, for like blind or low vision or deaf or hard of hearing, those are considered group sales. Um, so there's a block of tickets that are reserved, and then people who want to participate in that particular event are in that block of tickets. Okay, but just uh, in general, if I needed, uh, if I or someone went to the game who needed those services, um, are there specific areas of the ballpark uh, that they were encouraged to sit in, or, or, or yeah, how would that work? Okay, so like someone just coming to a game, not on Yeah, the yeah, like, uh, yeah, uh, so like the, yeah. We do have um, specific seating areas um, for low vision uh, folks uh, that is except you can purchase those particular tickets through our ticket office. Um, we also have our mobility assistance team at every single game, um, as well as our assistive listening device technology at every single game. So there's no other than having additional sighted guides available on Blind Low Vision Night, there's nothing, there's not, um, there's not an accommodation that isn't available at any other game. Um, sure. But instead, we just have, you know, more uh, to support the community that we're inviting. Understood. Understood. Thank you, and again, thank you for your uh, presentation. And uh, as a lifelong Red Sox fan and who's gone to many games, I look forward to going to. Many more taking advantage of the accessible seating in almost every area of the of the park, and and you know maybe I'll look to to making disability pride one of the games I I, cho I choose to go to this year. We would we would love to have you. This is Wes Elizabeth. You can go ahead. Yes, thank you. Yes, this is Elizabeth Dean Flower. Yes, thank you for the presentation and hearing about the different um, programs and uh, groups we're working with. 
Um, I have a question about um, the tickets. Um, are there, I know that um, you said a portion of, for some of the games goes uh, as donations um, to the organizations, but um, given that for some folks, um, the economics of um, trying to go out, especially if they're, um, you know, a, a couple of people, a family, or a group of friends, that that, that can be um, a more significant expense for some people than others. I just didn't know if, especially on some of these um, uh, highlighted nights, um, yeah. is that is that a fa is that factored in? Yeah. So this is that's um, this is where we really rely on our community partners, right? So before we even kind of go into a night like this, we're working with these groups that we're inviting to the ballpark, and we're saying, okay, we're going to rely on you guys to help us identify folks that may want to participate and may not be economically able to participate, right? So working with the Carroll Center, working with Perkins, working with um, you know Special Olympics um, to help them, I, to help you know us identify. Um, we do have a quite a robust community uh, ticket program, because um, obviously we understand the cost of baseball and being a baseball fan sometimes have to gap. Um, and so, you know, working with our community partners um, to try to identify folks who would want to be involved um, and doing as much as possible to make sure that folks feel included, you know, no matter what their, um, what their financial uh, capacities could be. That, that's, that's helpful to know because I know um, for some people, um, they might not be aware if they've had a change in life circumstance and now the disability um, that they didn't have before, they may not have been aware of some of the accommodations you've already had. But that, um, or even with this um, PCA program, that, that that's another aspect, as I understand it, is factored in. Um, if someone needs to bring a personal care attendant, that there are accommodations. I wanted to mention too that we also work very closely with our Red Sox Foundation, which is our organization's charitable branch, um, in order in, to fulfill big needs. They're very wonderful to us, though. So. Yes, well, I thank you again for um, the fact that these are. Uh, that this exists, um, these particular nights exist, and that there's an ongoing commitment to continuing to make it um, more accessible, more inclusive. Thanks. Thank you. This is Wes here. I would just like to ask the board if you have any additional questions um, or comments. Okay, so I guess I will go ahead and ask a few questions before we uh, move on to other board members as I see none right now. So I am also a lifelong Red Sox fan and I have enjoyed going to Fenway Park for many, many years uh, since I moved to Boston over 20 years ago. So uh, I look very much forward to uh, you know, my uh, prior sweetheart and now my wife have also, has also gone to these games with me very often. So we love going uh, to these games every year. However, uh, one big issue that has been an ongoing theme um, for the deaf community, including myself, is when will there ever be closed captioning on the Jumbotron screen, TV screen? And now I have learned about the new phone app that's available, but uh, it's not always uh, easy to look down at that during a game. And I often lose my phone battery by the end of the game and I miss what's happening out on the field. So it would be great. I know there's two different areas, two different screens. So, you know, for a pregame celebration, um, maybe during the anthem, the song, uh, there just simply isn't enough 
closed captioning. Um, it'd be wonderful to know what was going on on the field. You know, if there was a disagreement or, you know, especially a particularly strange play that happened or something, or um, uh, if they're holding the game for any reason, it would be wonderful to have live captioning available on the Jumbotron um, for everyone to know what's going on at a specific time in the game. So, and I've heard for many, many years uh, this recommendation going out that there's closed captioning on the Jumbotron. So what is the issue? That has been a long-standing issue, and that is my question. Brennan, do you want to take this one? Uh, oh, maybe she's having some microphone issues. Um, so, yeah, that is, and it's also something that we've tried to have some internal discussions about. Um, some of the things that happen in Fenway Park are within the Boston Red Sox control, and some of them are in Major League Baseball control. So, uh, trying to get to the bottom of, you know, who's the right, who are the right conversations to talk to, who are the right people to talk to, um, and yeah, it's definitely not an ideal situation um, to not have it on the big screen. Uh, working with some of the ribbon boards, so the smaller uh, boards around the park. Um, has definitely increased and um, getting more captioning in those spaces. Uh, but I can, I can completely understand the frustration of it would be great if it was in, uh, on the big board. So it's, it's an ongoing conversation that we're, that we're working on as well. It is, and we definitely appreciate the feedback as well. Hearing it is just as important and we value everything you have to say. So thank you for that. So basically what it comes down to is I don't have an answer right now, um, and we're working on it. Yeah. And just an additional comment to that, this is Wes. Is Fenway Park aware of uh, the requirement, the ordinance within the city of Boston to, in any public facing entity, to require closed captioning on TPs? Uh, so, well, with that, I see Olivia and then Richard uh, has some questions or comments. So let's turn that over to Olivia. Hi, uh, this is Olivia Richard. Um, I've been to quite a few Red Sox games with my best friend and both of us use mobility devices. And uh, we've noticed that there's a lot of standing and crowding around the mobility positions during play because for some reason those positions seem to uh, coincide with the beer locations. And um, it just, it makes it incredibly uncomfortable when you've got people crowding over you or around you or on you um just something i have a chance to put it out there use your mobility team to get these flies off of us i i uh i definitely hear i definitely hear what you're saying um and in those situations that's when we are very much relying on our ushers our ticket takers our greeters and our security staff um so you know talk to someone in the immediate vicinity say hey I'm getting crowded can you help me you know can you help me with this um, because that is definitely kind of the programmatic gap of um, you know they can have your back literally um, and kind of help and help move people along and that is their job right to keep people moving through spaces to keep things from getting crowded um, so you know certainly next time you're here um, make you know, make friends with your local with your local usher uh, or security guard, and um, you know they will do their best to keep that. But one of the things about our um, accessible seating is that they have very clear sight lines, so that makes them ideal places to congregate. Uh, so we try to definitely work against that. Thank you.
This is Wes. I believe that Paulette is typing a question that is a follow-up. Is there anything proactively that can be done for that situation? I'm, I'm concerned that whenever a person of low vision or uh, deaf or hard of hearing has an issue that when people are making plans for them, that it is incumbent upon them to bring it to folks' attention at the time of the event. First of all, you'll be dealing with beer drinkers. So that's not going to be a good situation. To, it's just like being at a concert and telling people down up front. That, that's not going to work well. So it just seems to me that they, since we brought this to your attention, that there should be something that you can do proactively for, excuse me, for the benefit of your guests. Yeah, we try. So can you speak um, to that? Yes, um, we. It's you know part of our training. Um, we work with the Disability Law Center um, to do extensive training for all of our staff. So they are proactive. They are looking for these situations. Um, sometimes it's just something that gets missed, um, and so it's certainly you know something I can bring up, um, and we can and we can talk about uh, potentially you know including and talking to more of our uh, staff about. Uh, but it is something that, um, you know, is a part of our, our yearly training um, and is something that they are proactively trying to prevent. Yeah, and Sarah and, both, and I have both done with talks a long time, so we would feel comfortable bringing anything that you bring up with us tonight to um, our entire staff. Uh, we, know, we know many people very well. Um, we would be happy to share the feedback that we have gotten from tonight. All right, this is Wes. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Yeah, um, just uh, to follow up to Paulette's question, isn't there a security number people can call at Fenway if they need to? And um, I also, uh, just to follow up on Wes's point, there are TV monitors all over Fenway. I'm wondering whether it would be easier to get the closed captions on them anyway. And then my last question is, um, is there a specific number that people can call who are blind or physically disabled to obtain their tickets without having to go through the normal processes? Um, so there is a dedicated ticket line. Um, and so if you call, um, you can either call the main number and ask, um, or uh, I don't have it right in front of me, so I will send it to you guys afterwards. There is a dedicated ticket line. Um, for that, so yes, you are correct in that. Um, there's two different ways that you can get in touch with security during the game. Um, one is calling, but we also have a live text feed um, that people can text in concerns to our security department um, in real time as the game's going on. And we have essentially like a dispatcher who can, you know, um, help get a copy, you know, get security folks to help in those particular situations. Um, so those are two those are two ways um, to be helpful in a particular in a particular situation. Getting the thing on the TVs is a good idea as well. We can start look into that uh, on the smaller uh, different TVs throughout the ballpark. Thank you. And this is Wes. I bring that up because it is a city ordinance uh, that was recently passed. Um, so um, I, I'm not sure why it's not the case. So Commissioner McCosh, go ahead. Thanks, Wes. Um, just a quick question. I saw the list of affinity nights that you have this year. And I know that there's a group I'm involved with who's doing a night and I didn't see it listed. So is this a complete list or how do people go about getting a night or a day at Fenway? How does so that? So the, the ones on the list this evening were specifically cultural and identity nights. Um, so those focus more on heritage. Uh, we also do have other theme nights throughout um, the entire season. Uh, we have them all listed on our website. The best way to find them is to put it into Google Red Sox theme nights, and the link will come up with all of our different 
um, different activities throughout the year. Um, to follow up on the captioning and the city ordinance about captioning, um, I believe there is a clause about large venues. Um, and so that is kind of what we're trying to look into um, is specifically what part of the ordinance uh, pertains specifically to us. That's what uh, a Elaine, who is our ADA coordinator, um, but I believe there's a large venue. Um, uh, Sarah, can I? Can I offer that we follow up offline? We, Wes, we do work closely with the Red Sox with David and um, Elaine, so we can follow up, up, up offline because we haven't checked in in about it in a while. Okay. That's okay. Any further questions from board members before we turn it out for public questions? Okay, seeing none, now is the opportunity for the public to ask any questions of the representatives we have here, Sarah and Brianna. Okay, I see uh, Mary Cooper um, who has raised their hand. Could you please identify yourself and then um, Thank you. So and then much. we do have this policy of asking for public comment. So go ahead, Mary. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Mary Cooper. I'm a sorry. If you're trying to, I'm a spinal cord injury patient or person. Um, uh, so I, I'm just. Krista McCosh sent me this today and said, "Do you want to jump in on this?" I um, work for the Boston chapter of United Spinal. And we are we provide we do one of those um, not theme nights for us, but we we do a spinal cord injury awareness um, game. And, and last year it was in September, and this year it's going to be September 10th. And so we've been working with the Boston Red Sox for this is our second year, trying to get as many wheelchair people into the Fenway Park as we can. Um, and it's been a, a very big challenge um, because of the accessible seating. And, and my question is, is um, first of all, go, um, using the MLB website, it is very difficult to get tickets as a spinal cord injury or any type of accessible seating. It's not a very user friendly, um, uh, whatever place to do. Um, and what I've ended up doing is um, calling, you know, the, the box office uh, when, and trying to get this game going. Um, uh, we, we've had run into the problem with companion seating. It, it, there appears to be a number of fixed seats next to the accessible seats. So when you buy um, a, an accessible seat, you, 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 can, you can have only have whatever three people go with you. We all know the ADA laws. But my question is, is can we get those fixed seating out of there? Because I would love to go to a Red Sox game and six, sit next to my friend in a wheelchair instead of a fixed seat where they, my friends can't, you know, and um, to me that would behoove them to do that and they might sell more handicap accessible tickets. Um, and, I, and I know that I've brought it up to other people, but I'm throwing it out to you. Is that a possibility? Uh, it's something that we're having conversations about. Um, so we're aware of the issue um, and having conversations internally. Um, so I don't have anything more that I can kind of add at this point, um, but it is a conversation um, that we are working on. Because I do recognize that you guys say, I know it's the Fenway is 100 plus years old and they want it to look aesthetically pleasing, um, but removing those seats doesn't make it look any less aesthetically pleasing than what they've got there now. And um, I just wanted, I, it's a frustrating thing as a person that organizes and love to get a couple hundred wheelers in there at a game. And it's very, it's just very difficult for us to do. So I'm, I'm just popping into this meeting to learn from you guys. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate the input and the feedback. Um, and just know that it is a conversation, an ongoing conversation that we are having. And Sarah, can I ask, um, we'll follow up after this meeting, but um, ask again, just to reinforce that we would like some of these issues elevated um, in the organization, that would be great. Definitely. 
the goals of getting on here and having an initial conversation um, was to go back, have some more conversations, and then obviously come back and talk to you, you folks and continue a dialogue back and forth. Okay, great. This is Wes again. Are there any other questions from the public before we wrap up this part of the meeting? Okay. Thank you both for your time, Sarah and Brenna. Really appreciate that. We really Thank appreciate you. your presentation and I'm sure it's been really beneficial for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Sure. I have a quick question before we wrap up. Okay. Yeah, um, before you, I'm so happy to be here. I'm called Ikale Rashid. I'm from Uganda, but I'm a PFP uh, uh, cohort 2023. And right now I'm here in Boston, uh, back at home. I work as a disability inclusion facilitator in Uganda, working with an organization called Ginger District Union, person with disability. But I'm a person living with a disability called cerebral palsy. First and foremost, thank you so much, all of you, for your presentation and uh, organizing this kind of event that uh, will bring on a number of people with disabilities to uh, bring out their uh, ability in different uh, sports. Um, yeah, my question is, you know, all of us, we are very versed with different types of disability, and each disability has a specific need and a specific challenge in one way or the other. Um, in her communication, I'm forgetting, uh, someone raised a concern that uh, how far different uh, disabilities are arranged and organized to enjoy the event without any distraction or obstacle. So uh, she said that uh, there are ushers who are in place to help persons with disability in one way or the other. So my question is here that how far these ushers are prepared to help people with disabilities during this event? Because usher can be, ushers can be in place, but remember our needs, our challenges vary or are different. So how far these people are prepared to help people with specific disabilities at the end of the day? Secondly is that the mode of transport and accessibility that is in place to help people with disability to get in maybe into the beach and out of the beach after these games, how far these two areas are really catered for. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I know our mobility assistance team work closely with our officers, um, receive specific training. The best advice I would give um, is that everyone is connected by radio. So if you were to find an usher, um, and if you did need additional assistance, and they weren't able to, to provide it, um, they could radio for the right resources. Um, everyone that's on our staff is very well connected to me, and they all communicate um, during the, the game. So I know that they will do their best to provide whatever assistance you need. Um, I hope that that does help. Um, I know I'm not specifically involved in training, but I do know they receive extensive training each season, um, and they work together to help. Um, but mobility assistance, um, which is station D is in David, uh, would be your best resource, but they can radio for them um, wherever you are. Thank you. Oh, no problem at all. Okay, this is Wes again. <clears throat> Thank you, Rashid. Thank you very much for your question. 
questions and we're going to move forward on the uh, agenda now the next item on our list is uh and again i just want to thank you both uh, Brennan. oh yeah. thank you really have a great night So I'm now looking at the agenda and we've gone through the chair's report and we're now at the commissioner's report, report which is still outstanding. So commissioner, would you like to take the floor? Yes, thank you, Wes. And I believe my staff is gonna share slides. So we'll jump right into my report. It's not too long tonight, so um, I'll just jump in. So Mayor Wu has coffee hours every year uh, in the spring she does this because it gives her a chance to go to different neighborhoods, meet her constituents, and um, get to see people face to face and listen to them and hear what their you know concerns and their priorities are. So the coffee hours for 2023 are well underway, but we still have a dozen left. So these are the ones that are coming up. There was one this morning in East Boston, and then the next one will be um, on Friday. That's on City Hall Plaza, and then uh, Brighton, North End, South End, Charlestown, and Hyde Park. Uh, right round out May. And then in June, we have Mattapan, Fenway, West Roxbury, Jamaica Plain, Mission Hill, and Back Bay Beacon Hill. So they're all um, at 9.30 in the morning at different locations. And you can log on to boston.gov to find out uh, specifically where they are. But I would recommend it if you'd like to meet the mayor and meet representatives from city departments that you attend one of these coffee hours. Next slide. Okay, so um, just an update on some of our events. Wes I gave a good description of the Disability Community Forum earlier, but just to follow up, I wanted to thank all the board members who attended. The public really likes to meet you all and get to see who you are and get to know about what you're working on. So thank you for making the time because I know a lot of you all of you have busy schedules and some of you took time out of work to do this, so we really appreciate it. Um, May Wu attended along with many other appointed officials, City of Boston staff and staff from the MBTA. And I feel like they all did a great job answering questions, so I'm grateful for, to them for attending too. We had about 35 community members attend in person and we had over 100 on Zoom. So it was a very well attended event. Um, those were the numbers of community members, and then we had a lot more staff. I think at one point I heard there were over 150 people on the Zoom. Uh, a lot of them were City of Boston uh, staff, but still they're all getting this information and listening to your concerns, so we think it was a great success. A video recording of the forum can be found through this link, and I'm going to ask one of my staff to share my report in the chat so that you can click on any of the links um, as we go through the report. Um, I also gave out the annual report from our office at the forum, and that can be found through the next link in my report. And then we also received dozens of questions that we didn't get to answer. We had put out a call before the forum for people to send in questions before the event so that we could ask them if there was time. We did get to a few of them, but again, there are dozens that we didn't get to answer. So right now we're working on getting the answers to all those questions. We're putting them into a document and we will post that in the next few weeks. So stay tuned for that. And then as you all may know by now, July 18th is gonna be our 13th annual ADA Day celebration. It will be from 12 noon to 2 p.m. on Boston City Hall Plaza. We have, uh, it's a great event if you've never been there. We have information tables. We are launching our Boston Breaks campaign for awareness of pedestrians with disabilities and bicyclists. We will be recognizing an outstanding partner and we have a speaking program featuring Mayor Wu, um, other officials, we have food, music, t-shirts and socializing and it's a lot of fun. So please mark that date on your calendar. It's Tuesday, July 18th. And we can go to the next slide. So for the last few months, I've been doing kind of a deep dive um, in my report to tell you about one initiative that we're working on. So this month, I'm talking about um, a national group that we're a part of. It's called the Coalition of Municipal Offices for People with Disabilities, or CMOPD. So this is a national coalition. We meet once a month 
to talk about emerging issues, we problem solve, we share best practices, and we make policy recommendations on accessibility and inclusion to federal agencies. And it's really uh, so amazing when I get on these calls with my colleagues because every city is dealing with the same issue, whether it's bike lanes or um, special education or outdoor dining, um, captions, there are just so many issues that we have in common that it's great to really brainstorm and talk to people who, who get it, who understand the issues, but also understand what it's like to navigate uh, local government to try to get things uh, moving forward. So the cities that participate include Boston and Cambridge, as well as New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Detroit, St. Louis, Austin and Houston in Texas, and Salt Lake City. So some of these are very densely packed cities like Boston. We know New York and Chicago are, and then other ones are have a lot of sprawl like LA and um, Houston. You know, they're not really densely packed, but they still have a lot of the same issues. So last year we launched our first group initiative. We held a meeting with the Department of Labor, including staff from Secretary Walsh's office to give our recommendations on increasing employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And what we did was we broke out six areas that we asked the federal, um, the US Department of Labor to look at. They included things like um, internships, um, sheltered workshops, which are no longer really acceptable, but it still exists in some states. So we asked them to look at federal policies that really impact employment and to take our input as people who work on the ground and see our constituents and what they struggle with. So from that meeting, we um, spun off into another meeting with the CMS, which is the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. And we talked about barriers to employment with them because one of the biggest barriers to employment is the limit on income and assets in order to stay on Medicaid. As many of you may know, Medicaid provides vital funding for personal care attendants, for wheelchairs, for certain therapies that traditional insurance doesn't cover. So people need Medicaid in order to stay healthy and to get up and get out of bed every day. But if you go to work and you make too much money or you, you know, own property or have some savings, oftentimes you're in danger of losing Medicaid. So we recommended that the federal government use the Massachusetts Common Health Program as a national model because Common Health has no income or asset limit. So for example, I'm on Common Health, I can work, I can have savings, and there's no income or asset limit, and I, I'm still on Medicaid. But I pay a monthly premium for my Medicaid, but I'm, it still allows me to stay on it. So this is one thing that we recommended they look at on the national level. So then next month, we're heading to Washington, D.C. to have an in-person meeting with Transportation Te Secretary Pete Buttigieg to discuss our priorities for accessible transportation. And if we go to the next page, I can just give you a rundown of what we're looking at. So some of the things that all of our cities are dealing with when it comes to accessible transportation, um, our airline travel is a big one. We want to be sure that on the federal level that airlines are maintaining and promoting policies that support disabled passengers who have service animals. We know that um, aviation rules are not, aviation companies are not subject to the ADA. They're subject to the Airline Access Carriers Act so they have different rules about service animals. And you may have seen in the news a few years ago, somebody tried to bring on like um, a service duck or a service goose. I've seen service snakes and things like that. So we're really asking the federal government to pay attention to um, actual service animals that provide a service for someone with a disability, a trained service for someone with a disability. Um, because we don't want to give it a bad reputation for you know, anybody, we just want to really focus on um, the fact that it's a service animal that's trained to do a task for somebody with a disability. Um, we'd also like them to look at creating accessible bathrooms for people who use mobility devices. We know this is challenging because air, airplane bathrooms are tiny, but we still think that there's more that can be done because a lot of people who use wheelchairs have to go long flights without being, being able to use the bathroom. It's um, not fair and it also discourages people from traveling. We want to ensure that power wheelchairs and mobility scooters are not damaged by airlines and that there's a clear process that they take accountability when they are damaged 
I know that happens all too frequently to myself and a lot of my friends. We want to ensure that they look at communication access for people who are blind, low vision, deaf, and hard of hearing, because communication is a huge barrier when it comes to navigating airports. We also want to have them look at uh, creating on-flight wheelchair securement systems so someone in a wheelchair can remain in their chair. And I know that's currently underway and they had an opportunity for the public to give comment, which a lot of people um, have done, so stay tuned for more information on that. And then looking at ground travel, there are several areas that we want them to uh, focus on. Again, creating um, dedicated funding to support paratransit systems, because you may have noticed like when the T is struggling with their budget, one of the first things that always seems to be on the chopping block is the ride. So we don't, we'd like dedicated funding just for paratransit because not only is it an issue of equity, it's also a requirement of the ADA. So we don't want that funding ever to be at risk. We wanna make sure that rideshare companies are held accountable for providing accessible vehicles, in particular wheelchair accessible vehicles. In too many areas of the country, there are no accessible rideshares. We're lucky enough in Boston to have a program, but it's only existing in, I think, three or four other states. So when we travel, we don't always have access to ride shares. We'd also like the federal government to provide resources and support to states so that they can invest in their taxi cab companies, which we know have been decimated from ride shares. We'd like to ensure that autonomous vehicles have accessibility requirements in place before they're approved for use. Because we saw this with ride share companies, all of a sudden they were out and on the road and there was no thought of access beforehand. So we don't wanna be chasing them down the road after they're already in service. We want all that to happen first. And then again, we wanna maintain and promote policies that support disabled pas passengers who have service animals. So these are some of the things that we're gonna be talking about to Secretary Buttigieg. Um, I will be traveling along with uh, several other uh, commissioners from different cities and uh, really looking forward to raising these issues on the federal level. And we can go to the next slide and that's it. So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I'll throw it back to you, Wes. Yes, um, we are open for questions then. Does anybody have any questions for the commissioner's report? I see Jerry. Yes, I do. Okay. I do have a question. And I see, I'm gonna recognize several people who have questions. Um, and that would be um, Elizabeth. Oh, and Jerry. See, Jerry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so Jerry, why don't you go first and then I'll call out. Go ahead, you're, you're, sure. you're, you're here with first, so go ahead and then I'll go through. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I was confusing. I lowered, I lowered my hand when I heard you mention my name. So sorry if it created confusion. Thank you, Wes, and thank you for commissioner for your report. And I, I wanted to say too that uh, I was happy to be able to attend last week's event uh, in person, and it was great to see so many of uh, the advisory board members there, there in person, as well as see so many. Uh, um, you know, members of the community, uh, both in person and online, and I'm, I'm happy to hear about the number of questions because I, 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 I thought uh, the number of questions that we we took live was was maybe less than last year. So I'm glad to see that that there were a lot of more questions generated from uh, the registration period, and I look forward to seeing that uh, that document. Um, my main question in regards to your report, Commissioner, is how can we support, uh, how can the board support uh, you in your visit to uh, Secretary Buttigieg, uh, um, you know, if, if we can support you at all in that? Yeah, that's a great point, Jerry. Um, it's interesting, a lot of the other cities also have um, advisory boards or um, you know, public boards that meet, um, like you do. Uh, a lot of them are the same relationship, like their advisory capacity boards, and they work closely together with the city offices on disability to push things forward in their cities. So we have a check-in meeting before we meet with the secretary. 
I will raise this issue and see what the others think about getting their boards involved, whether it's um, a follow-up letter to thank the secretary um, or, you know, a letter. Because I think by the time I go, it will, it will be before the next board meeting because we're going like June 1st. So um, maybe it would be a thank you letter and just uh, emphasizing that you all support all these initiatives and talking about the work that you do um, as a member of our tag and, and all the work you've all done on accessible transit and just how vital it is to, to sure. people. Sure, I know we uh, I know we were able to, to provide a letter, a thank you letter, I believe, to uh, to Secretary Walsh uh, after after you uh, met with uh, representatives from his office. So anything we can do to support would be great, and to elevate these issues. And thank you for bringing them to uh, to uh, his attention. I'm glad that you'll be able to meet with him. So yeah, and Jerry, I'm going to follow up with you offline if that's okay, because. Each commissioner has taken a different um, topic to talk to the secretary about, and my topic is paratransit. So, okay. to talk to you about Great. that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, this is Elizabeth Jean Clower. Um, thank you for the report, Commissioner. And again, I too was pleased by um, the number of members on the board who were able to attend in person. And I think in the future, I know that seemed unusual compared to other years that it seemed like there were lulls in the questions for in-person or on, on Zoom on, uh, at a couple of points. So I think um, if that were to happen again, I know that that kind of participation can fluctuate, but perhaps even to have a few more of those questions available if that occasion should arise again, but that, that's helpful to know that you're, you've been collecting those and we'll be putting that. Um, because I, Jerry raises a very good point, though. I think that is exciting about this next opportunity to discuss transportation. And in fact, I'd be happy to discuss paratransit with you as well. Um, and as an aside, I was pleased that um, Michelle Steeler from uh, um, the MUTA from the ride um, and the staff member, her staff member, Megan, were in attendance that day um, at, a, at a, a disability forum. Um, I was curious to know, um, for the issue of people being able to stay in their wheelchair on a flight, is that something that's years away or, or what kind of, is there any yeah. yeah, it's been in development for years and there's been some recent movement to try to push it forward. Um, I can send out some links to the board tomorrow because I know they had a public comment period probably late last year because I know I waited on it. Um, but it's been, a, it's been talked about for a long time and it is moving forward, but it's very complex because the securement would have to be equal to that of like a seat that's you know really built in in a plane along with the seat belt so and then you also have to have space for it so there are a lot of complexities but there's also a lot of uh, will to get it done so i'd say it's still a ways away but i'll send some information on it and i'll also follow up with the whole board to see who wants to talk about paratransit before my trip because i know olivia you probably have thoughts too and other people yeah thank you Okay, so I'm going to call um, Charlie. Charlie, why don't you go ahead, Charlie, with your question? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is Charlie Kim. Um, it's more of a comment, and and just thank you, Commissioner, um, about last week um, that we were able to, to to come in person. I think the it it um, it was very impressive for me to meet everyone on the commission um, in person uh, versus being on Zoom. And uh, I appreciated that you had everybody uh, give uh, uh, an intro, Commissioner, but then also a uh, priority uh, for them because that allowed me also to listen to how distinguished everyone is on the um, on the commission. And um, I just wanted to say that it that it was uh, I felt very honored to be up there with with everyone, um, with all the backgrounds 
and the advocacy that you do. So it was um, it was very nice to see everybody in person, and I hope that uh, we'll have something in person again, not just waiting till next year. Um, but it was it was a very impressive group when I looked at some of the pictures um, as we spanned across the front front of the room. So I just wanted to thank everybody again, and it was great. Thanks, Charlie. That's a really good point. I hadn't realized some of the new board members had never met anybody in person because a lot of us are so used to a lot of the board members have been on the board for years. So um, that is a great point. And yes, I'm always impressed by the board members, um, not only their backgrounds, but their continued advocacy. So um, we were thrilled with the turnout. And we were saying internally in our office, I don't think that many board members have actually ever come live to a meeting. So maybe everybody has that itch to get back out in the community because it was a great turnout. Any further questions or comments from the board? All right. Um, for the public comment question, let's hold off on that for a moment because we do have another item on the agenda and then the public input will be at the end of our agenda. Going on in the agenda, any announcements from board members? Any announcements, anyone? Well, I do have one announcement, one thing to share with you. I am potentially thinking of having the August meeting canceled for that month. And I wanted to see if that would be all right with everyone. Okay, see no comments. All right, no comments there. So I guess I will go ahead and cancel that meeting for the month of August. Now moving on to old business, the health discrimination discussion that had been shared with us. I believe in the last meeting, Jerry, you had mentioned that you had a follow-up with Bill from uh, BCIL. So, Jerry, do you have any follow-up information for us? Um, yes, I, uh, Bill and I were in, Bill Henning, the executive director, and this is Jerry, uh, by the way. Um, Bill Henning, uh, the executive director of BCIL, and I uh, were in contact um, via email after, after that meeting, uh, shortly after the last meeting. And uh, he's very enthusiastic about coming to a future meeting. Uh, and he, th he th thought about bringing uh, staff as well that could speak to the issue. Um, and uh, the last I knew, uh, 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 the commissioner's office, I Andrea, or someone from the commissioner's office was going to uh, connect with him and, and uh, hopefully schedule a, schedule a future meeting for them to come and pre present. All right, this is Wes. Let's have you coordinate with Andrea, um, who would be able to help us prepare for having Bill on a future meeting agenda and figuring out which month would be most uh, convenient for him to come. Yeah, no problem. I know she's uh, she's away this week, but uh, but. Um... You know, when she's back, I'll, I'll uh, more than happy to reach out. And like I said, Bill was very enthusiastic about about uh, his ability to participate. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Wonderful, thank you. This is Wes. Any other questions or comment uh, related to the healthcare discrimination story collection?
All right, uh, Olivia. I was just itching. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's I allergy you season. Oh, all right. All right. So I guess there are no further comments or questions from the board. Boston Public Schools, BPS Transportation, and the follow-up for that. I believe that Commissioner McCosh, you were going to provide an update related to the BPS uh, transportation. Perhaps that was Charlie as well? Yes, um, I think we agreed. I know Andrew and I had talked about getting um, data on a monthly basis from the transportation office at BPS whether it's training or new hires or um, any type of data statistics that they could give us, uh, metrics, but I did not get to follow up on that, but I will make it a point to put that in my, at the top of my to-do list and hopefully we can establish a monthly update, at least on metrics. All right. Thank you. This is Wes. I do know that Boston Public Schools has a transportation committee. I, I'm unsure how often they meet, but there is a committee. Charlie, go ahead. Uh. I, um, Chair, I think the what has been established is a task force to start working on um, how to prioritize some of the changes and um, and uh, get more feedback from from parents and to, to really figure out how to fix some of the operations. So that's the, the meetings. I can um, I could reach out and see um, if those minutes are, are public because I'm not sure if the task force is a, is a internal um, entity or if it's a public entity where people can attend their meetings. So, um, but I do know that they have convened a couple times and I think it's just to set the charter and the, 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 uh, the actual schedule of meetings. Okay. Thank you for that, Charlie. I think any information would be very helpful that you get for us. So please do look into that for us. Thank you, Charlie. Any other questions or comments about the BPS transportation? All right, moving on to new business. New business, uh, Olivia. Was that an itch or a hand raise? Hand raise this time. Um, I had one thing on the BPS transportation, and that is I'd like to see some tracking of how many students are missing school per day because of the transportation issue. Um, because of lack of transportation. Because I think that's where the real true issue is, is these kids are missing out on an education. Yes, well, so just to clarify the ask, Olivia, you're asking, you wanna see uh, data tracking students with disabilities specifically? Okay. Okay, so that is something that we can inquire about. Yeah, while everyone's been speaking, I um, am writing these notes. So I will email Dan tomorrow. Okay. All right, great. So moving down on the agenda, back to new business. Does anyone have topics 
they want to bring forward for discussion in new business. Okay, moving on. Now it is time for public input. So does anyone from the public want to provide any information? I do ask that any member of the public please limit your time to two minutes. All right, I see Khalil, your hand is raised, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, team, and uh, everyone on this platform. First and foremost, I'm so happy to attend this kind of meeting and to be one of the commissioner, uh, probably for this month, and uh, particularly for this meeting. Um, first and foremost, as I told you earlier on, I'm from Uganda, and uh, I'm a KFP fellow, 2023. Basically, I came to U.S. looking at uh, disability inclusion into former employment world. However, I've been uh, I've got opportunity to learn different things. For example, like today, I may not be in a better position to tell about the transport system, like my colleague said, but. Um, I want to say thank you so much because what I've got throughout here in this meeting is that uh, in USA, when it comes to promoting disability inclusion, all the states come together and combine the effort looking at one thing, for example, like the Commissioner Christine said that uh, very soon she's going to meet uh, the state representative on the issue of transport meaning that um, people with disability have a right to transport, but how are they protected on the way? Secondly, um, she has been talking about two modes of transport, and in my view, I've been thinking about uh, how far are you looking at people with disability accessing water transport in the US? Secondly, uh, there is another form of transport, like bikes, motorbikes, uh, how people with disability are protected when it comes to accessing and use of motorbikes in USA. Thirdly, and my last point here, how far these commissions or the leadership, both in Boston and the other parts of the country, how are you far involving parents to see that, like today? As the committee and the commissioners, we are at the same level discussing disability issue, either education, health, and discrimination, and so on. How are you engaging parents to see that they, you're moving at the same pace? Secondly, even uh, people with cerebral palsy, uh, people with disability, sorry, how are you bringing on them on board to see that you're moving at the same line. Thank you. Hi, Rashid. Um, it's great to see you. Uh, Rashid and I were able to meet last week. He's doing a fellowship with the Institute for Community Inclusion at U through UMass Boston. So I got to learn about, about all his work in Uganda, and he learns about some of our work here in Boston. So um, Rashid, we are over time. And you had a lot of questions, so I would love to follow up with you one on one. Can we do that tomorrow? But yeah, really, it's okay, it's okay. okay, really briefly, I will say that the city has um, a committee called the um, Active Transit Team, which a member of my staff is a part of, and they look at what what's called micro mobility, and that is things like scooters, bicycles. Yeah. Um, there's like electric skateboards. There's all kinds of micro mobility. And they're meant to get people, they call it like the last mile. So if you can take the T to a certain stop, but it's a mile away from your work, how do you get from the T to your work? To encourage people not to use automobiles because we know T stops aren't, don't let out right in front of everybody's building. So, you know, what if it's two miles from your building? Like people might not want to walk the two miles, but is there a micro way that they can get across the city? So. We do a lot of work in that space. Um, it's great work that the city's really thinking through. Um, 
And then was one of your questions about water transit, did you say? Water transport, water transport system. How people with disability are, like, how are they protected? Because whether you have a severe disability or not severe, regardless, or any category, and you have a right to enjoy water transport, how are they considered when it comes to accessing and using water transport? Thank you. Okay, so I'll definitely follow up with you tomorrow, but just briefly I will say that um, the City of Boston coordinates because the MBTA runs ferries um, as part of the um, commuter program that they run for um, fixed route system. Um, so we would coordinate with like state agencies that run that, but um, let me follow up with you. I have your email and we'll follow up, but it was great to see you and thanks for attending our meeting. Thank I'll you. I'll talk back to you, Wes. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the public? Anyone else? Now I would like to ask someone to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Olivia, I see your hand raised. Are you making the motion? I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. All right. And Jerry, I see that you've raised your hand to second. Yeah. Uh, this is the second. Okay. Both sides second. Okay. All in favor? Okay, the meeting Aye. is adjourned at 7.38 p.m. We will see you again on June 14th. And go Boston Celtics, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, bye. Bye, have a good